worried about the information age, it's here, it's the internet, it's the web, it's happening right in front of us. It's, it's a privilege to be here watching it happen because I've been worrying about it for decades. The internet boom hasn't even started. I mean, people are all, you know, geeked up about it, but we're just beginning to scratch. I think we're in the roaring 20s. You're living a web lifestyle when you just take it for granted that any purchase you make, any new thing you want to plan like a trip, you turn to the web as part of that process. Uh, people today live a phone lifestyle and a car lifestyle. And they almost laugh when you say that to them because it's just so taken for granted. There are no secrets. There's no time for delay. There are plenty of competitors who are going to eat you alive. You need to not take a breath and start over and do it again as soon as you get done the, you know, you know, with one. And you need to juggle three or four of these all the time. That's how you compete and survive if you're in the software business uh, on the Internet. In the web universe, the person with two years' experience has gotten more experience in web years than uh, someone who's got 20 years of the previous generation of programming. Uh, it's a bit of an overstatement, but um, web years, you know, are a wonderful curiosity of the general public and an uh, actual health threat to those who work in the internet. Nothing illustrates the incredible rate of change in the internet better than the story of six young guys I first met with four years ago in that garage. Straight out of Stanford University, they started a company then called Architects, and I've been coming back every year to watch them grow. And have they grown? The company, now called Excite, is worth more than a billion dollars. Let's flash back to that first meeting in 1994. It's hard to look beyond, we need a demo, and we need it now. Usually at the core, there's, there's, there's one guy with you know, minimal social skills, but just amazing <laughs> yeah, brain. We have one he, we have he's one got, uh, <laughs> he has great oh, yeah. social skills. Oh, he has so. great social skills. <laughs> here you are. Well, how's it going? It's going great. How is it, how is it like working with these semi-incompetents? <laughs> they're, they're all quite competent, <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. How much so far has this all cost? Two thousand dollars, maybe. Do you still have money in the bank? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. We're frugal. <laughs> We're really frugal. It's amazing. That's why the rice. That's the, that's, exactly. that's the rice. Exactly. I'll return to the architects' boys to see how they get on, but already they were smart enough to see that information technology was going to be a big business. No surprise to find that the World Wide Web has become a virtual mall. One of the first virtual stores to build a real business is a virtual bookstore. This is Amazon.com, the brainchild of Jeff Bezos. He figured out that books were the ideal internet product because you don't need to touch before you buy. So Jeff rented a giant warehouse in Seattle, hired a bunch of Generation X bibliophiles, and ships the books which customers order from Amazon's website. So far, Amazon hasn't made a profit, but it's valued at more than a billion dollars. Clearly, a lot of investors think Jeff's internet idea is hot. There's a sort of a fundamental irony that we're using bits to sell atoms. And yeah, it's, it's a little wacky. But it works, and it's extremely efficient, and people recognize the value. A year after we visited the Architects boys in their grungy garage, they'd gone through the VC experience and moved into a real office. The boys were a year older and five years wiser. Working 100 hours a week can do that to you. The venture capitalist who backed the Architects dream was Vinod Koshla. Now, what made me spend five or $10,000 on 15 minutes on five guys, or really two guys, so, Joe Kraus uh, and Graham free Spencer, free who I was meeting for the first time, who had never had a job, never had any success, had completely crazy notions of what applications they wanted to pursue. There was something about them that said to me, they are good entrepreneurs. They were good listeners. They were good debaters. They were thoughtful about my comments. They didn't give in to everything I said. They didn't disagree with everything I said. And I really liked the vibrations, the wipes. They were really good wipes. The revolution being created by the internet is different from all previous ones. It's abolishing distance. This is my garage. A few years ago, I'd get in my car here and drive to the office. But today, thanks to the internet, it is my office. 
In fact, it's the headquarters for my intergalactic business empire. With my computer plugged into the internet, I run two software companies, write my column for PBS, and attempt to manage my life. It's a revolution, all right, and you know what? We owe it all to the Russians. The race to the new frontier, outer space, was the new sensation of 1957. Up through the past thinning atmosphere, the climb into the space void, from the desolate... It began with Sputnik, the, the satellite launched by the USSR in 1957. Sputnik caused a worldwide sensation and sent shockwaves through the U.S. administration. It forced two presidents into action. Their separate initiatives both paid off years later in 1969. President Eisenhower created an agency called ARPA to fund high-powered scientific and space research. Being an army man, he made the Pentagon responsible. So, obscure academics suddenly found themselves on the Cold War's front line. The money we spend yearly without putting a single weapon in our arsenal is $5 billion, $200 million. It created a considerable stir. It was clear that the area that we had chosen to work in uh, was going to get more attention. And science, for a long time before that, had not had a particularly good name. It had not been a big deal. And I think there was a sudden realization that it maybe was important after all. All pre-start time lights are correct. The ready light is on. President Kennedy's challenge to the Russians was to commit America to putting a man on the moon. He gave that project to NASA, the civilian agency. By now, it had taken over from the Pentagon responsibility for space research. Godspeed, John Glenn. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. As NASA launched America's first astronauts, Pentagon scientists decided computers had the right stuff. Compared with the high-profile moon missions, computer research was something of a Cinderella. Throughout the 1960s, it was the space race which got all the media's attention. The computers of the 60s were the size of small apartments. Their use was strictly rationed and only a few people got anywhere near them. Still, a visionary psychologist at MIT, J.C.R. Licklider, known to all as Lick, saw their growing potential. The computer technology has been moving in a way that nothing else people have ever known has moved. Here's a field that gets a thousand times as good in 20 years. Lick had this concept of the intergalactic network, which he uh, believed was uh, that everybody could use computers anywhere and get out data anywhere in the world. Specialized hardware facilities tend to be expensive but very efficient. On the other hand, if they can be distributed, then specialized hardware facilities can be very effective and can let us do things that we couldn't otherwise do. Lick was thinking big about the future of networking at a time when there was only a handful of computers anywhere in the world and decades before the personal computer would arrive. The vision was really Lick's in the, in the, in the originally. I mean, any, none of us can really claim to have seen that before him nor anybody in the world. I mean, Lick saw this vision in, in the early 60s. He didn't have, have a clue as how to build it. <laughs> he didn't have any idea what to do to make this happen. By the mid-60s, the Gemini program was regularly sending American astronauts into orbit. On Earth, ARPA was funding mainframe computers for research at major universities. Mainframes were too big and expensive for personal use. But in keeping with the communal spirit of the times, a system was devised to provide more people with computer access. It had the science fiction name, Time sharing. 